to you. Uh, uh, uh. Bear with his black, it just takes a couple of moments for me to get the video. I can bear with you as long as you like. Right, okay, I think I've got it here. I pause my video. So I'm going to send you that in the chat now, and then remember to click that link so it'll be in the chat via Skype. So this is a live one. Okay. Let me know when you see that. All I've got is an HTTPS thing, that's all. Um, yeah, that, that sh should be. The link it's just disappeared. It was a blue screen with HTTPS with a website link. And now back to where we were before. So I've sent you another one um, in the Skype chat. Um, no, it's disappeared again. Okay. Um, do, you want me to hit, do you want me to hit chat? Um, yeah, if you hit chat, yeah, that's what you, would, what you did before and you clicked on the link. Yeah, and you should see it. Okay, got chat. Now you want another click on the link to YouTube? Uh, yep. Okay. Right. So let me see. Does that come up for you? Ah, we got it something. Here we are. There you go. So if you pause that video on the left-hand corner, you'll see there's a few buttons, and it just like stops you being out of sync. If you see what I mean. Got it. Yep. Right. So give us two seconds, guys. Who are people who are going to be joining us soon? Uh, I need to get this out to social media. And as you know, if you're familiar with these Q and A's, it does take a couple of minutes, so bear with me. Uh, 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 where am I going? I'm going to my site. Do, do, do. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, that should be up here now. Uh, uh. What by why you do this, uh, Black? Yeah, what have you been doing this afternoon or or today? Uh. Big edit job this afternoon, Mike. Um, the second book is uh, with the publishers, and they fire everything off to me, and I then have to go right through the whole thing again. All the mistakes I've made, they pick up. And the, the guy I've got is incredibly helpful. Incredibly helpful. John Ellis, greetings, and Phantoms Forever. Absolutely right, John. Yeah, evening or wherever you're from, John. Uh, right. So I'm getting there black, but uh, yeah, so while we get started, while I do this, uh, tell us a bit about uh, your, obviously your most recent book and the project that you've got coming out. Uh, well, the current book, um, a couple of thoughts came out about that. People said, you know, I wish I knew more about your father. And I thought I'd done him justice in the first book, um, but I don't think I really did. So during the last COVID lockdown, I just churned out a, a prequel. I didn't like writing about myself. So writing about father was much easier. I have more <laughs> material, more material to work with, which was uh, more fun. I had used all his letters, but I also found another sixty or seventy letters that had come back with him from uh, North America. The information. I also had father's logbook, which I don't know if you can see. I'll hold up there. Does that look good, good to you? Yeah, we can see that. That's father's logbook. And wow. uh, once you can go through that, it makes a heck of a difference. Um, so I was able to tie the letters together with what was in uh, the logbook. And uh, one of the most fascinating things I found was that I hadn't realized all through training, um, while he was down in Devon, the blitz was going on. <laughs> uh, and he would refer to my mother to stories he'd heard about uh, this area of London and that area of London getting hit by bad bombing. And I found a diarist, a woman who kept a diary throughout the London Blitz. And I was able to relate my father's worries to um, what was in her in her diary. And it was absolutely fascinating. And she was obviously intelligent, well read, and she wrote beautifully. Uh, and there were only 500 pages of, of Blitz, well, the whole Second World War. But the Blitz bit was particularly interesting. And I think perhaps the biggest thing that came out of that from me was her respect for Churchill. Massive. 
She used to listen to every word he said in Parliament when they broadcast it, and he broadcast to the nation. Um, it left me with a thought that Churchill was probably one of the first real influencers. Right. <laughs> by what he did. Hi, Adam. Um, by what he did, um, by way of um, talking to the general public and explaining his concerns. And her great point about what he said was, he didn't hide anything from us. Okay. What have we got? Captain John Young flew F4s and so did a lot of legends. <laughs> I think we use the word legends too, too freely. Um, you know, who are the real legends? I'll give you one, uh, not an F4 flyer, a man called Ray Hanna, um, who led the Red Arrows uh, very early on when they were flying Naps. Probably uh, the greatest leader and, and of the Arrows that there ever was. And certainly the chap who taught me the most about leadership, uh, even though I only flew in his back seat. Well, yeah, before we start with the Q&A, maybe you can just give us a... I know we, people, um, have had, we've had you on the show before and they might know a bit about your back, background, but for our new viewers, uh, can you just briefly tell us what you flew uh, during your military career? I can. Um, I started off... Well, I had a private pilot's licence at about 16. Uh, that was courtesy of a grateful government uh, when I got a scholarship <laughs> at the Kremel. Uh, 30 odd hours um, for a 16 year old, very exciting. And then once I joined the Air Force, uh, three years at Cranwell comprised, first of all, uh, a, a bit of um, time on the uh, chipmunk. And then the last year and a half was probably 150, 160 hours on the Jet Provost. Right, I better get on one of these questions. John Bayliss, hi John. How did the hand, Phantom handle at low level? Very well. Um, I think the great thing about the F-4 was it was a hell of a solid platform. Um, it was easy to handle. I mean, anybody could fly it. Uh, and you had lots of power from those um, spay engines. Um, so when you were flying at low level, even if there was heavy wind or bad weather, you, you had a really solid platform. Uh, and it, it didn't take um, as much buffeting as a lighter aeroplane might have done. Uh, and you could set it up on a heading and it would just stay there. It, I, it was a delight to handle at low level. The interesting thing was, um, there's a story about whether or not the J-79, which I also flew, or the Spay engine was the better of the two. Um, at low level, I would always use the, the Spay. Just a good, solid engine. And put the burner in at low level makes a, a massive difference. Makes a hell of a noise that upsets people. Right. I'm not sure if I've asked you enough, but perhaps I have. Right. Uh, the Freckleberry, hi, Freckle Puny. Hi there, John Ellis. Did DOD contractors still fly hunters? They, ah, DOD contractors flew hunters with the Navy. Deeply envious for them, um, for being able to do that. Darkly coloured, they weren't done in the RAF um, camouflage, but, you know, the privilege of seeing them fly against naval ships uh, at low level was brilliant. Moving on to Bill. Would the British fans have been better with the American engines? Um, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, what was better was the fact that we actually gave the British um, engineering people some work. We gave Rolls some work. Um, it cost an awful lot of money to convert the F4 to the British engine, but it was a, an offset cost um, that benefited British industry, so it's, it's a good thing. Would it have been better with the American engines? Well, we had F4Js with American engines. Um, and to tell the truth, they weren't that different. Um, low level, probably better off with the Spay, maybe at high level with the American engine. But the basic reason for having the British engine was to give Rolls-Royce some work, and it worked. Okay, right. I'm going to have to go back up and pick up uh, Adam. For sheer flying pleasure, what would you pick above all other aircraft? Gee, what a lovely question. Um, do you know... I've never flown it, but I would love to have flown the Spitfire. The nearest I came to flying it was the best hour I ever had at an aeroplane, and that was in a thing called the Sea Fury. Um, I worked in London bringing a, a restored Sea Fury back onto the RAF inventory, and for that I got the, uh, a free ride in it, and it was the most pleasurable hour I ever spent in an aeroplane. So if I could do another hour's flying again, it would be the hour in that uh, Sea Fury. Flying over um, places like Salisbury, beautiful blue sky, the odd puffy white cloud, 
romantic, you know, almost Second World War stuff. The nearest thing I ever came to flying something father did. So that would be my sheer pleasure. Give me, give me a Spitfire, but I, I haven't had one, so it would have to be a Sea Fury. Uh, it got crashed, by the way, shortly after um, it had been in service about three or four years. Not an easy airplane to fly. Right, Sebastian Cranen. Where'd you get the Gripen model? When I flew the Gripen over in uh, Sweden. I used to work for BAE for about five years after I left the Air Force. And BAE had a share, I think 20% of Saab. And because I was required to be able to talk about what Saab did, um, a great friend of mine said, well, you have to go and fly the airplane. And boy, did I enjoy it. Um, lovely aeroplane, ahead of its time in terms of electronics, uh, very powerful engines, and it handled beautifully. Right, the fragment unit. Do I think the Hunter was developed, upgraded to its fullest potential? Um, I think it probably was, to tell the truth. If I were to take it any further, it would, might, might be perhaps to put a missile on, on board the aeroplane. Um, but I think when you bear in mind when the Hunter came into service, which was in, in the 50s, I think, uh, but I'm not an expert, um, we gradually developed it. Um, and I reckon that we almost took it as far as it would go. Um, and the Harrier, yes, the Harrier was constantly upgraded, but it was a more upgradable, pardon me, let's try that one again. It was a more upgradable aeroplane because the Harrier was upgraded not just in terms of uh, airframe, but also, uh, importantly for the GR9, with a massive new avionics suite. So you could complement um, Lurk's leading edge route extensions on the Harrier with uh, new electronics and turn it into a, a, a far superior aeroplane to the Kestrel, which it was when they first evaluated it before they developed the Harrier. Right. Uh, hi, Timberwolf. Be impressed lately with UAPs. Oh, UFOs. Have you had any instant or stories from trusted friends? No, I haven't, and I don't believe in them. <laughs> Maybe you can shoot me for that. Um, up engine the feelings on the up engine Italian, sorry, Israeli Air Force F4 2000 a loss. It's a bit like the story of the Hunter, I think, and I'm not an expert on on up engineing the airplane. You can only take an airplane so far, and as I mentioned with the Harrier. I think if you up-engine an aeroplane, uh, all you're doing is making it go faster, perhaps get it to turn a bit better. But what's really going to add value is better electronics, better missiles. Um, uh, so up-engineing, up you know, for me, that, that adds less. Uh, and, and I think that Harrier example I just gave you is more important. You know, can you make this aeroplane better at night, shall we say, for night attack? Can you make it better with... Um, uh, smart weapons, those sort of things. Bill, I believe the Hunter was transonic. Could it go supersonic? It was <laughs> supposed to have been um, supersonic in a dive. It certainly went transonic. Um, you probably know the interesting story about the Hunter. When you got it going downhill in a dive really fast, if you'd got a couple of notches of flap down, perhaps you'd been in combat, and then you tried to pull out of that dive, you ran out of tailplane authority, so the aeroplane failed to pull out. And when I was first on the F-4, which was in the early 70s, late 60s, there was a story, I believe, of a wing commander who had just that happen to him. He forgot to pull up the flap. It was going very, very fast, possibly even transonic down a hill. And he didn't pull up the flap, so he didn't pull out of the dive, so he crashed. There we go. Uh, yeah. I agree with you, John. The Turks and the Japanese did get them upgraded, but I'm not quite sure what that upgrade was. You might want to put a little note on the screen here and tell me what the upgrade actually meant. Percentage, how much work, this is Paul W., how much work did your Rio do on a typical mission? That would depend on the mission. Um, I'll, I'll start with a dangerous one. Night ground attack. Uh, most of us who grew up in the what was called the DFGA, Day Fighter Ground Attack uh, people and hunters, we valued the D bit. Well, we didn't do much day flying. Um, you know, I did 15 hours in about nearly two years. So we, we didn't want to fly by, by night if we could. Uh, um, it was a, a pain in the backside. So when you're working at night weaponry in particular, that Rio backseater is incredibly valuable. Um, Couple of things. So you're dropping, shall we say, retarded bombs at night. Uh, you're in a 15 degree dive. You must hold that dive absolutely 
at 15 degrees. The moment you shallow out, you get an early sight picture, the bomb goes unscorable at six. That Rio really saves your backside by keeping you in that dive. Uh, and for instance, if you ever got target fixation at night, he would get you to pull out. So I think the, the, uh, the backseater is incredibly value, uh, valuable at night. He's incredibly valuable in combat because if he doesn't pick up a radar lock on the target you're fighting against, uh, you're lost. So I couldn't put a percentage on it, but there are times when they are incredibly valuable. And also they're your conscience. Flying single seaters, you could lie about what happened, uh, and people did. In the back, you know, when you're flying with a back seater, there is no way you can hide from him when you screw up. It's um, an incredibly valuable thing to have a guy in the back uh, who knows how bad you are at times, but is still happy to fly with you because you know how bad you are and you try and recover from things when you're not doing them well. Um, I, I sold on the two man concept, uh, and a good back seater is phenomenally helpful. I can't put a percentage on it. Right, did I have an aircraft type you wanted to go to after you finished training? Yeah, I wanted to fly hunters. And beyond that, uh, I wanted to fly Harriers. But um, I was unlucky in many ways. I, I went onto the F4 when I would rather have gone on, onto the Harrier. But the thing about the Harrier, um, it was a difficult airplane to fly in those early days. Even uh, somewhat after that, a friend of mine who was a very good pilot scrubbed himself from Harrier flying because he knew he was uh, stretched and couldn't cope with it. And having done that, he went on to do incredibly well in the Air Force. So I wanted to fly the Harrier. Uh, I didn't. I got onto the Air Force. Never regretted it, but I'd love to have had a chance of, of flying the Harrier as a younger man, although I flew it as an older man. Um, you'd, I just wanted to fly single-seaters too. Right. Would the Gripen, this is from the Freco Pioneer, have made a good high-low mix with the Typhoon, or would there have been too much overlapping capabilities? Um, I think you have to look at any question like that in two ways. Firstly, and don't forget I worked a lot in the ministry dealing with buying airplanes and uh, supporting the front line. It may have been seriously expensive to have uh, a high-low mix of two types uh, because you're duplicating all the support equipment. It isn't just the airplane, it's the equipment you've got that supports the airplane that costs you money. So any mix of airplanes is going to be more expensive. So in some ways, it's less good than a single type that can cover the whole lot. Um, I think I'd rather have stayed, if I were the chief of the air staff, I'd rather have stayed with uh, the Typhoon. And I would have done what we've done, which is develop the Typhoon's capabilities in the classic way. It starts off as an air-to-air -air fighter, and then you get to develop it for air-to-ground capabilities. So, I mean, if you had endless money, um, you might consider uh, a mixed fleet of airplanes for different cap cap uh, different um, requirements. And I'll go back to night flying. I'd want a fleet that allowed me to bring in airplanes at the ultra low level, like the, the tornado cam with terrain following radar, another area where the navigator is absolutely essential. I want an airplane that could do that. Uh, and I probably want an air to air fighter too. Um, but you, you couldn't mix these days those two types. It's too, it's too, it's just too much of a single aeroplane. Typhoon's probably as, as almost the last point we're going to get to where you can do almost all the roles out of one aircraft. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Uh, right. Jack is smiling. Have you ever had an aircraft depart? Have I? And as an extension question, that, did the Phantom aircraft talk to you and let you know how close was the limit? Yes. Um, I think anyone who's flown the Phantom will have had it depart on them. And the wonderful thing about that was you didn't have to be a genius to recover. You just let go everything. And if you let go everything, the airplane would usually recover. Um, so, the, you know, the first time it happened to me, uh, I just let go and bingo, it, it came back to somewhere near um, normal, you know, straight and level flight. Um, did it talk to you beforehand? Yes, it did. Uh, lots of ways. Um, there were two main ways. We had a thing called an angle of uh, attack indicator that went from, I don't know, zero down to about 30. The ideal turning performance was 19.2 units. And if you put the angle of attack gauge on that, then you were getting maximum performance out of the airplane. And at that point, um, you, you got a sort of a, a solid beep on, on the tone that accompanied the angle of attack gauge. But then if you went beyond that, being below it wasn't dangerous, but being above it, 25, 26, 
that you'd get beep, 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 and they go higher in frequency and, and faster. So you'd know something's going wrong here. Um, and then on top of that, there was a, a thing called the pedal shaker. Um, so if you had your feet on the rudder pedals, one of them would suddenly, I think it was probably the right one, would suddenly start bouncing around like crazy. Uh, and so if you've missed the, the, uh, the sounds, uh, uh, the beep, 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 uh, uh, then you, you, you'll catch it on the pedal shaker. Answer, let go of everything. And if you do let go of everything and, and that doesn't come out, you've got plan B, uh, which I never had to um, deploy. But you got yourself into a spin, you could always whip out the uh, drag chute, which supposedly was going to save you. I don't know. <laughs> I never tried it, thank goodness. You didn't have to be that bad to depart the aeroplane either. All you had to do is try too hard. Right, uh, John Lewis, radar and avionics. Uh, let me just get that back. Um, I've just moved past you. Where are we? Uh, able to handle new missiles. I'm not quite sure what you mean there, John. Radar and avionics. Handle new missiles. Blah. Um, if the missile... I'm not quite sure where the question is going. I'll see if I can get this right. Uh, if it's just a launch and leave missile, then as long as you found it on radar and, and, and you let it go, it, you know, it'll do the job itself. Uh, some missiles, you have to sort of keep, it, keep tracking. And so if you turn too far away from the target, uh, the missile would no longer guide. Um, but I'm not quite sure I've answered that question properly. So I'm not quite sure about the question. Right. Dark Power UK, instant account. Look forward to more of these. Okay. Uh, the Iceman 95, what a great name. What's the max speed I've reached in the Phantom? One point something large, about 1.5 or 6, I think. Um, do you know speed is, speed's only really fun when you're close to the ground. Um, the fastest I've ever been is lying on a sled on the crest to run, doing about, I don't know, 40, 50 miles an hour with my head literally inches above the ice. And at that point, you feel like you are going faster than you've ever been in your life. Move that into a phantom, uh, low level, and do four or 500 knots at low level. That feels fast. The lower you come, the faster it feels. Um, I don't know if you looked out at TV and watched a Formula One motor racing driver, and you see what he sees throughout the, the front of his, aircraft, uh, his car. Um, it's the same sort of thing. But I guess the short answer to your question is in the high marks, one, five or six. But it's no big thing. You know, speed is a relative thing, as I've just tried to make uh, clear. Did I ever see a Soviet aircraft close up? I saw one uh, and it frightened the shit out of me. Excuse my French. Um, I retired. I was uh, traveling to visit a spook who was then um, the sort of charge d'affaires in the embassy in Prague. Absolutely love you, man. His brother. Uh, was Sir Richard Dearlove, who ran MI6. I just crossed the border from Germany in my car, carrying 96 bottles of red wine for him in my Shogun. I'd just gone through the border. It was sort of uh, late, late afternoon, and there were big trees on the left-hand side, sort of German pine things. And then suddenly, about 100 yards in front of me, going like stink from left to right, at the treetop height, was a... A, a Czech Hind, a Soviet um, helicopter. My heart just went boom, 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 boom. I'd studied the airplanes all my life. I knew about the um, camouflage, and it it really frightened me. I'll be quite honest. I, I, it, it took me out of my sort of comfort zone. But that's the only one I ever saw, and it was the most unexpected time. Other than Hunter and Phantom, what else did you fly beforehand? Uh, <sighs> A little puddle jumper called an air coupe got me a pilot's license as a schoolboy. I then flew the Chipmunk before before the JP and the JP before the Nat. And the Nat was a delight. You had to sort of shoehorn yourself into the cockpit. It was a tiny airplane, much tinier than the Hunter. But it turned beautifully and it was a delight to fly. So those are the ones I flew before the Hunter and the Phantom. Adam Cotton. It became apparent to me lately the RAF has historically been hamstrung by budget considerations. Yay. For instance, the emphasis on ultra low level ground attack was relative to that. Agree. Um, difficult question to answer. Uh, let's take the first part first of all. Um, it hasn't just been lately the RAF has been hamstrung by budget considerations. 
The services, all three of them, have always been hamstrung by budget considerations. We've never been able to get what we want. Um, I was talking to Mike beforehand about a woman who listened to the Blitz and uh, all through uh, the, the London bombing. And she used to write comments. And one comment she wrote was, we never have enough airplanes. And that was a woman who just watched the bombs come down as a fire watcher. And then you say, for the emphasis on ultra low level ground attack was a result of that. Uh, no, the emphasis on ultra low level ground attack was simply that the defenses were getting better and better. In the, I suppose you'd call it about the 60s, uh, towards the end of the 60s, the Soviets were putting together what they call HAZ, hardened aircraft shelters. They were protecting their aircraft, so we had a problem with those, and that made us want to develop uh, precision attack weapons. Their low-level defenses also got better. We, no one wanted to go in at medium or high level because of radar defenses, so we wanted to go in at low level. Um, and the safest way to do or to beat those radar defenses, we thought, was to go in at ultra low level. So it was due to the defenses we did that. Why did we go at night? Because we felt naively in the 70s, um, well, maybe they won't be so, this is an awful, awful pun, but they won't be so awake at night. Uh, we would add to the element of surprise if we did night attack. Um, so that was a, one of the hairiest things I've ever done, uh, teaching people from the back seat to go and fly against targets on the ground. Right, the Frekopin is back again. I think the Japanese F-4s got new radars biased towards air to air and anti-shipping. The upgraded Turkish christened F-4 Terminator, oh I love the word, biased towards ground attack and deep strike. Only one point to make on that, and that's that well, they asked us how we would do anti-shipping strikes. And we thought perhaps the best way might be just to put a socking grate um, missile uh, into a ship. Uh, sort of track it uh, and then put the missile into the ship and hope that the air to air missile would uh, track onto the ship and throw the big hole. Don't know if it would have worked or not. Never tried it. Uh, my father reckons, says Bill, the lightning could outfly the Phantom in Germany. Any view? Um, yes and no. It, it depends on, on your circumstance. If you put the two of them up at height, uh, the lightning would out could do Mark II, and the Phantom uh, would have been uh, harder to get to Mark II, so the lightning would outfly the Phantom. If you were doing a turning fight, the Phantom would outfly um, the lightning. Bring it down to low level, where the F4 was so good, then um, the F4 would certainly outfight um, the lightning on on the ground, and also. Fighting's not just about the aircraft. I touched on weapons earlier. It's about how good your weapons are. And the Phantom weapons were a heck of a lot better than the Red Tops on, on the Lightning. So um, I hate to be um, against your father, Bill, but uh, I, 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 he must have been a Lightning pilot, so he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> but uh, I think the Phantom's got it in most circumstances. Um, John makes the point, John Ellis, that the Wizzo or the Rio can pull the handles if the pilot gets spatial disorientation. Yeah, but a stage before you get there, he can reassure you that your wings are level. Uh, and this is about rapport between front and back seater. Um, you may not like the guy socially, but if you work with him well in the air, I never had a problem with anybody socially, but... In the air, if that guy has a good rapport with you and you trust him, and that's the key word, if you trust that backseater, he can pull you out of trouble, as it were, without needing to pull the handle. Um, I've got the utmost respect for the guy in the backseat, having uh, done a lot of it. I'll tell you a funny story about backseat flying. I was doing a check ride as a wing commander. No, I was a, a squadron leader um, at the OCU. I'd left Sixth Squadron. We finished night attack. I became an OCU instructor. After about two months, I was doing my sort of check with the boss, a guy called Bob Honey, a really nice guy. Um, he went to sign the aeroplane out, and I went to crank it up, which meant getting the INAS ready and everything, and I put everything, everything in the back seat. And I thought, there's something wrong about this. Do you ever get that moment when you think something isn't quite right? And I couldn't work out what it was. And then it struck me, there's no stick in the back. Uh, the stick was removable on, on our two-seaters. So I shut the airplane down and went back into the dispersal, uh, met Bob Honey coming out. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, we can't take the airplane, boss. It's got no stick. No, he said, go on. Don't worry. You do the trip without a stick. So I had to go back and do the whole trip without a stick. The only snag about that was 
uh, a few years earlier, Bob had done um, a bit of low flying, uh, very close to the ground. He'd gone straight through some trees at low level, and we were planning to do some low level on this sortie as well as some range work. So I did that whole sortie with a guy who'd been through the trees once, lovely bloke, and he was very safe, uh, and all the work on the range. Um, and it's unpleasant. I've got to say, as a pilot with, without a stick in the back, it feels unpleasant. It's almost like um, if you ever early, got early air, uh, car sickness. I certainly did. Um, but, it, you know, you don't get car sickness driving. Uh, and also, when I flew in the back and I felt rough, I'd always ask the guy in the front for about, you know, can I have five minutes on the stick, please, just to feel better. So, um, interesting question. I digressed. Favourite flying moment in the Hunter or Phantom? Oh, um, OK. Favourite flying moment in the Phantom? We ran a small team on 92 and when we did displays. Our last display was down at a place called Po in the southwest of France. We had the most epic weekend. Um, and I flew the shortest Phantom sortie I ever flew. And it was the, probably the best, uh, I would say that, wouldn't I, but everybody else felt the same. It was the best display we'd ever done. Um, we were up and down in about 14 or 15 minutes. And it was the only sortie we never, ever debriefed. One of the reasons we didn't debrief, and here's the bit why it was so much fun. We taxied in, and there was a huge crowd uh, lining the taxiway as we taxied in. And all of a sudden, my nav, a lovely guy called Ron Cook, said, what's going on? Look in your mirror. I looked in the mirror, and the three guys behind me, all the navigators, had climbed out, and they were walking out along the left wing, leaping off the wingtip, and going in and to, to sort of shake hands and kiss the girls in the crowd. So that was my favourite flying moment on, on the Phantom. Um, I, I, I won't bore you by doing Hunters, because I can't beat that. John, all operational F4 still had race heat controls. Uh, no, not in the F4. Uh, the UK F4s only had a number that were back seaters. Right, I've just lost where we were. Let's get back to you. Um, hang on a minute, I've just lost the spaces. Done that. 56 or 74 squadron, uh, unfair choice. Um, both had fantastic histories. If you want something to do in your spare time, look at the history of 56 in the First World War. Uh, second was interesting too. And look at 74 squadrons history. Brilliant squadrons, both fabulous. Pascal Chauvet, bonjour, bonsoir, monsieur. Uh, weren't the Space Phantom beautiful flyer? Yeah, they, they did have rapid engine response, but their reheat was not rapid. You put reheat in, and then you counted to about three, and then the reheat took. The J79, you put the reheat in, and bang, it worked. I need to catch up with the questions. Chris, 935. Did the Phantom require a lot of trimming? Uh, not really, and you do it unconsciously. Um, we had a thing called the top hat on the top of the stick, which I got one to show you. It's over in my uh, bedroom. Um, but it didn't require a great deal of trimming. Uh, and some people you like to fly slightly out of trim, so you're holding a small um, degree of uh, tension. And that particularly applied, I believe, to people who like did a lot of close formation flying. They like to have it slightly out of trim, so they're always holding a small stick force. Brock or Lane, did you ever fly the tornado? Yes, I did, uh, day and night. Uh, and I told you how much I hate night flying. So for a, I was a two-star when I flew the tornado as a deputy commander in Germany, and to be brave enough to stay current for night flying in the tornado and do air-to-air -air refueling, I was a brave lad, but they only ever put um, really experienced backseaters in with me. I learned a heck of a lot about uh, how Germany worked by spending uh, time crossing the North Sea to UK ranges uh, and to do low flying because we couldn't low fly in Germany. So, um, yeah, I flew the tornado a lot. Nice aeroplane. Um, what was the highest amount of G I ever pulled in a Hunter and a Phantom? Which handled the G-forces best? Okay. Uh, just over 7G in a Hunter. Uh, when you pulled out of um, ground attack with a Hunter, we were doing air-to-ground uh, rocketry or air-to-ground bombing, or in particular air-to-ground strafe, where the closer you got within legal limits, uh, the easier it was to get good scores. You did get close enough to get quite scared, and so you used to pull like stink. Uh, and uh, it was very easy to overstress. So I overstressed any number of hunters, I think, um, in the ground attack role, and that usually meant going way beyond six. I don't remember any really bad um, overstressing in the F4. I did damage an airplane once. Um, I'll tell you a brief story about that. 
uh, which handle G forces the best? The fans did because the um, blow up stuff we used to wear, the kit worked better. Uh, the only phantom I damaged, I put a small hole in a port uh, trailing edge flap through landing the airplane at backseat through an ill-considered decision. I was checking a guy out um, night on the range in Deci in German, um, Sardinia. Uh, and as I was saying, it gets crashingly boring and um, unpleasant spending so much time pointing yourself at the ground in the dark. So I saw I fly the airplane back just to you know, get some time in. Uh, and as we got near the landing point, we were doing a GCA, a controlled approach from Australia. He said, do you want me to land the airplane? I hadn't thought that far ahead, which is awfully bad because I was a guy who always wanted to think about everything behind. I forgot to think about it. And I said, oh, I'll have a go. Um, and of course, I landed it just short uh, and took the top off a little runway light, the last one that led into the uh, airfield. Uh, and I thought it was fine until we landed. And then suddenly, I was seeing new parts of the airfield I hadn't seen before because the guy in the front turned us off much nearer, you know, where we were parked than we usually did. So anyway, I got back and the engineers found this hole in the uh, left-hand trailing edge flap. I realized I'd hit this light. Bad boy, got the biggest rocket I've ever had in my life. I cannot tell you. Another story. Uh, too young for the meteor, I guess. What's my opinion of them? Um, a couple of things to say. We bought about 3,947 uh, in the Air Force, and we flew them for about 36 years overall, and we lost 890, uh, and half of those roughly were to fatalities. Uh, in 1953 was the worst year, and we lost 145. Uh, in 1952, one of the non-fatalities that were lost was my father's youngest brother, but that's another story. So we used to throw airplanes away, um, which was a sad thing because we didn't have the airplane to throw away. Uh, they cost a lot of money. So I thought it was a great airplane. I think it was very difficult to fly on a single engine. If you imagine you've got two engines, they're not like the F4 lined up together in front of you. You've got one halfway out the right hand wing and one halfway out the left hand wing. So like the camera, when you're doing asymmetric flying, uh, it's quite tough. Guys doing instrument ratings used to come back with a pain in their knee because they would do part of the work with one engine out. And to hold the aeroplane in trim, back to the previous question, you had to have a great foot full of rudder to do it. Um, fabulous. And they were the Gloucester Meteor. And as I live down near Gloucester, I'm chuffed with that. Right. Satyajit Lal. What's the common loadout uh, with the F4? Um, we always carried three... Uh, dummy um, missiles, sparrows. Uh, we rarely carried uh, dummy, uh, um, what were they called? Uh, the seed seeking missiles, the sidewinder. We, when we had those on, um, they were really good because they would pick up a growl. So there weren't enough to go around the squadrons. We didn't all have them, but we always had those three dummy uh, um, sparrows. Uh, and Often we flew with a thing called a strike camera in the left forward sparrow uh, housing. And that was to, in the ground attack role, which was the most fun, to take pictures of the targets as you went over them. That was really important. You'd identify a new target. And because we didn't have the system where you could actually release a weapon against a target, we used to take film of it. So those things were underneath it. Um, a couple of um, external tanks, two large tanks, um, the most fun uh, fit though was to go clean wing for air combat against other aeroplanes, ideally um, dissimilar aeroplanes. So the most common loadout was probably with those two external tanks. Right. What was to, was talking about the FR upgrades? The avionics are upgraded for new missiles? Uh, no, not really. Um, once the missile is upgraded, for instance, if you can lock on with a for a radar. Uh, tracking missile, you don't need to upgrade the radar for the missile to work better. Uh, this is the same with the uh, the Sidewinder uh, heat seeker. You can put a, a sight on a target, um, and no matter which grade of, of uh, Sidewinder you've got, the Sidewinder does the work, not um, the, system, the F4 system per se. What altitude says uh, Sajid Lal F4 turn the fastest? Do you know, I, I really don't know. 
um, it would it would depend on the speed you're at. We used to fly around at low level at about 420 knots. And I talked earlier about having 19.2 units on the AOA when you've got the maximum degree of turn. So, um, oh gosh, it would turn best at 19.2 units. So it, it's, uh, and that was 19.2 units at whatever altitude you were at. <clears throat> uh, I'd rather not turn my hardest too close to the ground because it's dangerous. But I, I honestly can't tell you, uh, maybe a QFI who talks about those sort of things. All I knew was in combat, air to air, all I want to do is turn that airplane as hard as I can um, and to get out of the way of or get on the tail of the other airplane. So it's almost an academic question. I apologize for not giving you a better answer. The Freckle Puny, which Soviet Warpack type did you respect the most? Do you know, there's a similar question came up before. Um, I didn't really mind. Um, I, I didn't respect their air crew as much as I respected the air crew of the other nations within NATO I flew with, because I didn't think they had enough flying. Um, their aeroplanes in general, and some of them came through RAF stations I was at after the Cold War ended, uh, were a triumph of thrust over drag, socking great engines on things literally bolted together like old tractors. Um, so, you know, the, the sophistication of the aeroplane never impressed me. Um, what I would have respected if I thought it was good would be their ability to control those fighters onto me. It didn't matter if a guy's behind you or firing a missile at you out of visual range. It doesn't matter what he is. What matters is the, the capability, we're back to weapons again, of the missiles being fired against you and the capability of the defensive system, which controls that Soviet Warsaw Pact type onto you. That's why we flew at low level so much, because we figured there their ability to control airplanes onto us would be more limited. Right, we're back to Sadrajit Lal. Er, were there any reports? Gosh, I've just spun this too far. Um, let me have a look. Forgive me. Uh, um, I'm sorry, my machine has... Uh, are there any reports of the performance of the F-4 against the MiG-21 in Vietnam shared with the RAF? Do you know, there was a difficulty of doing these things. A friend of mine flew all the um, Russian airplanes out of San Diego when he was at the Naval Weapons School. And when I went to my first job in the States, my initial posting was to the American Fighter Weapons School. But it got changed. It got changed for a very good reason. I, was, I would have suffered if I had gone there from what my predecessor suffered from, which was called the Secret No Foreign Curse. The Americans weren't allowed to tell us things which were at this, quote, secret no foreign level. So I, I didn't know, for example, uh, all that I needed to know about things like the MiG-21 in Vietnam. Where I learned about it um, and where the people in the RAF learned about it was when the Americans brought their aggressor squadrons over to the UK and Alcumbre initially. Uh, and when I was in the States flying um, against the aggressors there. There, the air crew shared their knowledge uh, and the fact that I was air RAF, I could sit in without running up against this um, huge secret no foreign issue. Um, let me add a, a linked point. The Americans had lots of Harriers and believe it or not, we didn't get all the feed out from all the accidents that all the Americans had. And it would have been wonderful to be able to know about issues they'd had come up against because they might well have had a, a bearing on um, even though there were slightly different types of Harrier that we were flying. So no, the, the, the flow isn't always as good as it might have been. Right, uh, back to Sergeant Lal again. Did the RAF make a better turner than the Nat? Yeah, Spitfire, best turner we ever had. Facetious answer, I'm afraid, but I need to speed through the um, uh, questions. The Spitfire did turn absolutely beautifully. And again, just one other point about it. It told you, um, at the sort of buffet, uh, I talked about the pedal shaker telling you you were about to lose it. The Phantom would do the same thing. The airplane would buff it very slightly when the um, airflow over the wings wasn't working to best effect. Same thing happened with the Spitfire. Uh, I could talk about Spitfire all day. I love it. Timberwolf. Did I take blood? Um, no, I never did because it came up after I would uh, got to, to a level where uh, I couldn't go. I only went as a, a sort of... Um, 
supervisor as a two star. What the squadrons in Germany I was um, with, uh, looking after as a deputy commander, they went out there. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to uh, jump on this airplane quite literally and go there and enjoy. Um, so I don't have any good tales about um, Red Flag. Um, I got lots of tales about uh, engaging with Yanks. Um, because I flew with them for three or, three or four years. And the best tales were from the guys who'd just come back from uh, Vietnam. Hang red flag. These guys had done it for real. Uh, and the lovely thing about these Americans who'd come back from there was they were, if not the quiet American, they, didn't, they weren't boastful. They weren't aggressive about what they'd done. Uh, it was just a job, and they learned a lot. Uh, and I had huge respect for them. Um, and I had huge respect to... For the back seaters who'd done so well, because although there were a couple of front seat aces, uh, there was a guy called Chuck de Bellevue who converted the front seat and I flew with him, who'd got five, six kills in the back, I think, five of them with Steve Ritchie and one with somebody else. Um, so all my stories were tales of how the Americans dealt with it out, out there. Um, the best one, I'll give you a, a, an aside, it's probably not flying, but it's interesting. Best guy I ever flew with, uh, with was a guy called Dave Rickett, who was also a lovely bloke. Uh, Dave installed his wife um, in the neighboring country. Uh, I forget where it was, Lass or somewhere. Put her into a, uh, an apartment. And he was what was called a fast fac, a fast forward air controller. And every now and again, he'd say, oh, I think I've taken a hit. I better divert. So whether he'd taken a hit or not, he diverted to the airfield near where his wife was um, staying. Uh, and they'd send people out, check his airplane out and say, no, you're OK, Colonel or Captain, you can drive her back. By which time he'd had a couple of days with his wife. So um, not the best story about flying, but that, that's how it was in, in those days. Right. Let's go back. What's the Phantom? Back to Sergeant Lyle. The Phantom better than the first generation of Harry's but used by the fleet air arm. Um, you've got to ask yourself what you mean by better. Um, the Phantom could land on a carrier. So, yes, it was good in that sense. It could carry more weapons than the Harrier, good in that sense. Uh, it could fly for longer than the Harrier, better in that sense. It had two seats, better in that sense. So um, my answer to that is, yes, I think it probably was. Right. As a fellow PBL holder, I flew chipmunks throughout 86. This is Adam Cotton. Nervous about spinning it, although I did. Um, yeah, was I nervous about the chipmunk? <sighs> Let me tell you, when I did my PPL, like you, Adam, I mean, I probably only ever flew straight and level. And when we were sick out the window once, but I didn't know about aerodynamics, all came straight back in. Um, but I then went to fly the chipmunk, and this lovely old master pilot at low level put it into a, what I thought was about a 90 degree bank turn and turned it hard. And I, I couldn't understand why we didn't fall out of the sky because there didn't appear to be any lift. We were all, almost at 90 degrees. Um, so that surprised me. Once I got over that, yeah, we did do uh, spinning. And I, I think you, you're right to be nervous about anything like that, because if you screw it up, you know, you're going to kill yourself. Simple as that. Uh, I think the key is to do something that's dangerous. Um, that scares you as long as you've thought about it beforehand and you know how to get out of it. It's rather the same... Um, if you're doing displays with a team of people and any time you fly, what's going through your head all the time is if something goes really badly wrong here, what am I going to do? Am I turning so tightly here that I'm going to embarrass the guys on my wing? You know, if I you've got to think it all through. And obviously you thought about your spinning before you did it. I did the same thing doing things called Porteous loops, which you probably did. You just pull up into a loop and when you're upside down, you stuff all the controls into one corner and put the opposite rudder on, I think, and it flicks. And it says very clearly in the chipmunk notes, you know, flick maneuvers uh, are not allowed. Uh, but you do it because you want to do it. Um, my father did the same thing, slow rolling a thing called the Oxford, which was two seater where they uh, taught you after you'd flown um, initially on Tiger Moths. And they were putting people on fighters during World War Two off the Oxford. Two seats with um, sort of ram's horn controls. And nearly everyone in their course did a slow roll. Uh, and you could just about do it. But he said that the wings used to flap around a bit. So once you've done it once, you didn't do it again. I bet you did more than one spin there. Right, Sebastian Cranon. 
Why did the RAF and the FAA put so little emphasis on the anti-shipping role? One would think that an island nation would maybe want anti-shipping missiles on their tornadoes. That's a good point, you know. Uh, I, I don't have a very good answer. Um, we did have anti-ship missiles uh, and they were carried on board buccaneers. So to say that we didn't put emphasis on them is wrong. We put less emphasis on those than on others. And I remember being scared to death. We're back to being scared. The thing about Martel, the anti-shipping missile, was it had a television in the front, which the chap in the back who guided the missile onto the ship watched in order to put the missile straight through the ship. So you'd sit there watching this video, and initially the ship you're going to hit is just a speck on the horizon, or the target is. Um, and it becomes bigger, and it becomes recognisable as a ship. Then it becomes a big black thing, and then the whole screen dies. <laughs> and it's quite frightening. So we did have some, uh, but we, you know, there's hardly enough room for them after. I suppose the point of your question is, did we carry on with Martel and anti-ship missiles afterwards? No, we didn't. John Ellis, my friend has stories of flying and landing from the backseat pit of the F4. So have I. Better from a circuit where you can see what you're doing. Doing it straight in is much more difficult. Right. Jemdam, have I ever had an opportunity to fly or talk with or fight against former Eastern Bloc pilots. What do you think about your former counterparts? Um, no, I haven't. Um, I, we touched on this earlier with the question about what did I think of their aircraft. Um, let me just give you a, as a completely bizarre example. What was the highest scoring fighter pilot in the RAF during World War II? Um, a guy called Pattle, I think, uh, who fought a lot in, in uh, Europe and Malta. John Johnson's largely regarded as the highest with about six, six, uh, 36. Um, Yet yeah, there were others. I found out through some research. My father was shot down by a guy who was his 45th or something, 46th or 47th kill. A guy called Rudolfa, who shot down 222 fighter, uh, LR, enemy aircraft. He was shot down himself 16 times. Um, he flew over a thousand combat, uh, a thousand combats, and flew right through the war. How good was he? A lot of the people he shot down were absolutely straight and level, um, and he did nothing but fight uh, and fly against other people. So you'd have to say, pure numbers-wise, he was, you know, seven times as good as Johnny Johnson. I'm not sure that's necessarily true. It's a sort of uh, Roundabout way of saying, I really don't know. Um, I think I've, I've touched on the answer earlier when I said I respect anybody who's got a good missile and who finds me before I find them. Uh, I'm not fussed about the guy flying because most of us are, are pretty average pilots. You know, the real gifted aviator is one in a, a thousand, a million, I don't know. Right. Favorite memory of my time at Watersham. Oh, crikey. What can I say? I don't need to think about that one. Um, I tell you what, I met some fabulous people there. And I'm going to tell you a story which has nothing to do with flying. Battle of Britain service at Watersham in about the middle of, 80, the, middle of the 80s. Um, I'm going to tell two stories. The Bishop of the Forces gave the address and it was absolutely captivating and what he did was to read a chunk from the dirge sung by a Cretan woman when the body of uh, an RAF pilot was washed up on the shores when he was fighting for you know for the allies um, and it was the most moving thing uh, I think I ever heard um, that was one of the most uh, wonderful memories from Watersham the other Favorite memory, um, Takival. You, it's hard to explain and express your thanks for how hard people work getting ready for Takival. And I remember uh, I had to brief everybody before our last Takival, and we were playing cricket at the time. And I remember having to climb up these steps, still wearing my batting pads, uh, and talk to half the station. And then we went into, into Takival the next, well, next week for three or four days. The way people behaved, the way they went the extra mile, I just, I was in awe of everyone from the SAC at the, you know, most junior level 
to some of the wing commanders, who, well, all the wing commanders who worked for me. And the way that station came together for Takovo, uh, to me, was absolutely splendid. So, uh, you know, I've got plenty of flying memories, but those two are the things I remember most of all. I also met some wonderful people. Did you join 92, says Bill, at Wildenrath with Phantoms? Uh, yes, I did. The day I joined 92, I found out uh, it was the highest scoring outfit after World War II because the, one of my crews had just shot down a, uh, um, a Jaguar with a guy called, lovely guy, a good squash player called Steve Griggs in it. So I went straight to 92 at Wildenrath with their fours. Um, they, they'd been there for some time, I think. Balatsa Vidra, good evening. Did you fly training missions with phantom pilots of other air forces? For example, with the colleagues from the Luftwaffe or the US? Yes, I did. Um, I flew with Germans, I flew with Americans. Uh, I've even flown with French people, but not in the F4. Um, we always had German exchange guys uh, when I was on 56. Very, very nice, nice people, uh, interesting people. Um, I could tell you funny stories about that, but uh, they were really good, really, really good guys. Um, U.S. Air Force, uh, guy flown with lots and lots of U.S. Air Force people. Uh, again, they were all, apart from that one fellow I mentioned, they're all good. It's very hard to say who's better than anybody else, because how do you judge better? I think one, one way of judging how good somebody is is how much spare capacity has he got? Can you, I mean, when you're teaching a student, for example, you load them and load them and load them until you reach the point where you, you're obviously reaching the point where he can no longer be cope with being given any more pressure. But the more pressure you put on a guy shows you how far you can take him. Okay. Dark Power, nice story about Meteor. Appreciate the insight. Yeah. Wink and Brody. John Bullen, ever been to Ascension Island? Yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> advice. Um, enjoy. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you're going to spend a lot, lot of time there. If, I, if I've got the place right, you've got to climb the mountain and go to the top and have a, have a look there. Um, but I can't remember much about it. I spent three or four days there, three trips trying to get to um, the Falklands uh, and three aborts. Only on the fourth time did we actually get the Hercules there. Waikas Abzal, any bird hit during your sorties? What did you do in this situation? Um, I had bird strikes, but, but nothing dangerous. Not like people who had them go through the cockpit. Uh, we'll be flying Bryce, A400 Atlas. Enjoy. My friend locked up an F-22 with an F-5 using Fleur and Sidewinder and smoked the F-22 in training. Sidewinder is pretty great. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you just press the button and away it goes, missile does the job. Dylan Minute, which air bases are you based at? Holy smoke. Um, Cramwell initially. Did a short time at uh, Stratishall, uh, doing sort of co-pilot job on a Domini. Uh, Brody. Chivana, great place. Uh, where else have I been? I can see Mike there, so I'll finish up with that. Um, been to Coningsby. Uh, that's about as far north as I've been. Do you want me to stop there? Uh, no, I was going to say, do you want to pick uh, maybe, yeah, maybe two or three more questions, more questions back before back we wrap this Q&A up? Yeah, Tim Woods says this guy is so cringy. Stop streaming. Uh, I don't think I want to answer Tim Woods. Maybe I'm cringy. Did the F4 Phantoms retain folding wings? Yes, they did. Um, we used to park them occasionally. Uh, did my father have any thoughts about the clip wing Spitfire versus Standard? Uh, not really. Um, he only flew the uh, 1, 2, 5B and 5C. Timberwolf. John. Okay. A seagull could kill me if it poops in my eye. Yep. Right. Uh, let's take Tim Wars, last one. Have I ever flown training in southwest Scotland near Whithorn? Uh, no, but we used to, one of the places we used to play uh, fly in Scotland was owned by James Robertson Justice, uh, an old actor who threatened to loose off his shotguns at us if we ever flew over his place again. So that's probably the last one I should take, I think. Over to you, Mike. What a great Q&A that was. I mean, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight for the great questions. I hope you enjoyed it. And always, Black, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I'm worn out, Mike. I'm talking too fast. I apologise, but I just want to get through all the questions. I'm going to slow down now. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, thanks for everyone for joining us and your great questions. And, yeah, I'm sure we're going to get Black sometime in the future uh, on for another Q&A. But uh, thanks very much and Black, thank you.
My pleasure. Sorry I didn't uh, impress Timberwolf, but it's one of those things, I guess. Right. Take care. Cheers, Mike. Thanks. Bye.